pessoal do Esquina, hoje a gente está ao vivo aqui diretamente do Mackenzie, no um seminário sobre gestão inovadora de bairros históricos. Aqui do meu lado, Michael Ball e aqui o Andy Russell. Thank you guys for talking to us. Thank you. É, eles vão falar inglês, eu vou tentar traduzir para vocês na medida do possível, mas se não depois a gente explica melhor nos comentários. Os dois trouxeram experiências aqui diferentes sobre patrimônio e preservação e a gente sabe que aqui no Brasil a situação é muito crítica, né? especialmente na questão de recursos. So, Henry, uh, could you please uh, speak a little bit how funding can be, can be, can be done to help preservation? Funding is never easy for heritage and preservation. But uh, as we were talking in the seminar today, there is probably more funding in the UK through Heritage Lottery uh, and other similar types of funds. Um, that's not easy. There's far more demand for Heritage Lottery funds than they have available. Also, there is a problem that people have been playing the lottery less recently, so it's less funding going towards the good causes of which the Heritage as well. But, It has been a major contributor to funding since it was started in the 1990s. A uh, major contributor to Heritage. Um, there are a number of other private donors and other funds which have also contributed to it. And it's quite surprising, particularly with uh, buildings I work with, like churches, how local people have, um, um, have raised the money that they need for, for projects. But um, I'm not going to say it's easy, it's a challenge. It's very difficult. And Michael, what's your experience about funding? Well, um, I, I would echo what Hed was saying, but say two other things. that uh, Most of what funding does is to start a snowball rolling down the hill. And of course, it's very small at the top, and you hope it's very big at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Of course, you hope it doesn't break after that, but at least you hope it's um, a much bigger thing when it's all over. Now, what's that bigger thing? It's leveraging um, effort by people. And again, what happens in the UK is things are funded that people are enthusiastic about, that they want to contribute towards. And that puts a lot of extra resources into the heritage process. But also, you have to look for the longer term as well. So funding is also done to help get some private investment into the area and to get think of new uses for old buildings. So it's um, trying to have take the best of the past but have it as a living thing for the present. And if you can do that, it gets people enthusiastic and it gets a lot of private sector funding coming in. So when they think of funding in UK, it's always that mix that they're looking for. And probably the public subsidy bit actually, if it works out well, is a fairly small proportion. It starts the thing rolling rather than is the total solution. Nobody would think that public expenditure would be the total solution. Although once it happens, heritage becomes more important, more discussed, um, debated on TV, and all these sorts of things. And, and, and in that way, people get interested. And how can you make those places come alive? We have a lot of places in Brazil that are almost forgotten. That people don't go there. We have Museum Nacional, Nacional Museum, that got fire uh, last week. So yes. nobody went there anymore. So how can you make those places live again? Yeah, that was that was a tragic event. Yeah, tragic loss. Tragic. I think the, you know, the whole world feels your loss there because of the quality of the uh, the artifacts that were in it. But um, it is a matter of finding new uses for building. How you deal with that building, I wouldn't want to advise you and tell you because I don't know enough about it. But what you do have to do with buildings is think think laterally sometimes as to what is going to be a good and sustainable new use for it. So it's got to be sustainable economically. It's got to be sustainable socially, so it's got to work with the people in the area. Um, and, people uh, that already live there. Oh yes, you know, you don't want to gentrify the area and chase the existing inhabitants out. You, you've got to have good community engagement so that you actually redevelop an area in the way that the people who live there want it. So you've got to you've got to listen to people. That's really it's a key thing. And if it's a good heritage-led regeneration project, then it will not only regenerate that initial project, it will ripple out and it will, as Michael said, bring the um, private money for further developments because people can see that this is an area that's working. 
So that's the sort of thing that we start. Private money, it's the key solution. No, um, going back to your previous question, how do you yeah. make these places suddenly appear again? And I think there's two. One, you can say to people, if you use ingenuity, not the people, but also the whole policy, uh, you can make this a great place to live. Suddenly, it, was a, it used to be a horrible place to live, and there are loads of places in North America and Europe which used to be horrible places to live, which have been made great places to live. So that's how you bring heritage into the present. But also, they are, you make them places that are fun. Not necessarily the same, because uh, you don't want to mix too many things together, but a lot of areas that become fun. People want to go there. People enjoy being there. And at the same time, they become aware of the heritage. And so that's a very good trick. So all this requires ingenuity and a focus on what works. And uh, livability and fun definitely work for most people. And what kind of uses can we do to that places? Because in Brazil, we have a lot of cultural centers, but not any place that can be preserved should turn to a, a cultural center. What can you do in these places? Stores, that, restaurants, what kind of experience? Yeah, you, can, you can do that sort of thing. It depends where your heritage asset is. Uh, I've got in mind, the back of my mind at the moment, as you were saying that, Oxford Castle, which is in Oxford in the UK. And it was not only the medieval castle, but it was also the prison as well. Um, so you don't want to convert it back into prison use because that's finished. So that was converted into a hotel and a number of cafes and uh, other similar eating houses were created there. Now that's, that's one thing, but it was close to the centre of Oxford. It was close to other commercial uses. So that was probably the right thing to do there. And in other places, it may be that creating some form of uh, other retail use, uh, some form of residential use might be appropriate. So it's, it's got to work with the area. It's, there's no sort of single solution. Uh, it's easy to put up a cultural centre or a heritage centre, but they don't make money. Uh, they're, yeah. they're easy things to think of uh, because you think you've got your heritage asset. Let's make the best of it. Let's bring people in and call it a heritage centre. But it doesn't make money and they close quite quickly. So you've got to think and you've got to be inventive in your thinking. Um, I can think of an example where, which is in Birmingham, and in the centre of Birmingham there are lots of interesting old canals and canal buildings that go with it, and also they, many years ago, made a lot of jewellery there, so it got called the Jewellery Quarter, but it got very run down, very dangerous, full of um, junkies rather than anybody else, and, and not a place that anybody would particularly want to do. And what they did was focus on making a good link into the city, so it, 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 rather than it being cut off as a space, linked in so people could, could feel comfortable walking in and out. And also they did it in a very mixed way, and, and, and the idea being, well, I, I guess, we don't really know what's going to work, so let's try a number of things, and if we try a number of things, we should hit some good buttons. So there was a mixture of residential offices, restaurants, bars, um, a little bit of history, and um, a, a lot of presentation of, of the past. And similarly, um, the canal was greatly improved, so now canal boats go through. And so there's this whole mix and it's one of the most lively places in Birmingham. From being a place where the people shun, it's now a very, very lively place. And people want to be there day and night. And what's the role of the legislators? So they don't suffocate those places and they can permit those kinds of different uses. The role of the, the legislators is to be, on the one hand, we have to protect the heritage. So you cannot have a complete free for all in terms of planning and heritage. So the English regime is fairly strict, but it has changed subtly in the last 10 years or so when there's been um, a move to Historic England, our national heritage body, calls constructive conservation. So it's a, me it's a means of redeveloping buildings, very much along the way that Michael was saying, but adapting them for new uses. Um, and that's not immediately the regime of the legislators, it's 
certainly the regime of um, planning policy that sort of lies beneath the law. We have quite a new uh, set of planning policy regulations that have actually just been revised for the first time now. So making those work properly and effectively. So it's a delicate balance to protect the heritage, but also to allow it to change subtly, uh, to make sure that it continues to be sustainable in terms of all the uses we were talking about earlier. I, I think the role of the public sector um, has changed enormously over the last 30 years. Um, uh, 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 some time ago, it would be the idea that we know best, we know what to do, we're going to change this just in the way we think, because we're the experts. And um, they've stopped doing that, they've stopped mm. saying, um, we, no, we, we, we can't make places work, because when we try it, they're just rubbish. And what they do have started to do instead is, is to be, be like more moderators, facilitators. So let's talk to the local people, let's talk to investors, and see if there's some common ground between them to try and create new places. So I think that's that's the big achievement that, we, that, we, that we've seen in, in recent times in, in that context. And there's a final um, area, which, which is, it's not just about plans, it's about making people stick to their deals. So you actually have a plan and you negotiate with the private developer and they're going to, say, convert this building into um, uh, 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 expensive flats above, some flats for low-income people within it, maybe some restaurants and bars on, on, on the bottom level. And they've got to stick to their deal. They don't stick to their deal. Uh, they, there are clauses in the contracts which, which could mean they could be severely punished. And that seems in the main to work. So you can't just dream and draw pretty pictures. You've got to make people stick to what they said they do. Great. Thank you very much for your attention and your time. A gente conversou com o Michael Ball e o Henry Russell, que trouxeram experiências aqui para o seminário de gestão inovadora de bairros históricos aqui no Mackenzie. Thank you very much. Have a Thank nice you. stay in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. I'm enjoying very much myself enjoying very much. Very nice. Very welcome. Very nice. Pessoal da esquina, valeu. Até a próxima.